living in the 21st century, we often think that we live in an age of unprecedented mobility, but mobility and migration were already omnipresent in the early modern period, both within Europe itself and between Europe and other parts of the world, such as Asia and the Americas. One major reason for this high degree of mobility was the fact that throughout the early modern period, Europe was a patchwork of relatively small territories and cities, many of which were de facto autonomous. This situation created not only opportunities and incentives for migration, as skilled laborers, for example, short employment elsewhere, national states, had only very limited abilities, resources, and information to restrict movement across the border of their territories, even when they wanted to do so. Nevertheless, early modern governments had a significant impact on the movement of people, cities, and capitals in particular, attracted people who could meet the government demand for soldiers, administrators, entrepreneurs, and other specialists. Especially following the Thirty Years' War, War, rulers in Central Europe, in particular, attracted people of talent not only to repopulate their territories, but also develop local economies and enhance cultural life, all vital sources of prestige and power. On the other hand, Restrictive and repressive measures against religious minorities and beggars will cause them to seek refuge elsewhere, and military conflict likewise displaced large numbers of people. Migration clearly was not always voluntary, but frequently the result of circumstances and even outright force, as is the case of the Atlantic slave trade. Certainly, religious and confessional minorities were the most conspicuous migrants in early modern Europe, although they may not have supplied the largest overall number of migrants. Religious migration took on many different forms during the early modern period, affecting all over Europe, human communities, such as Jews, Lutherans, Catholics, Calvinists or in the following century and adapted Quakers. Most of them survived in disguise, thousands of them perished, and ten of thousands fled abroad. So why did religious diasporas become an important phenomenon in early modern Europe, more so than in other historical periods or place? There were probably three reasons for this. First, the highly fragmented political and confessional landscape created spaces for persecuted minorities. Second, they were considered dangerous threats to a society, religious purity, which led to regular persecutions and expulsions. But on the other hand, religious dissidents were partially tolerated for economic and political reasons, allowing persecuted minorities to settle elsewhere. Third, religion was and remained well into 18th century the mainstay of people's daily aspirations. As a consequence, a specific creed was also a sufficient motive to leave everything behind. We will consider in this chapter a number of particularly important cases of religious migration. We will firstly look at the Iberian Peninsula in Portugal after the massive influx of Sephardic Jews from Spain and the forced conversion of all Portuguese Jews in 1497, the so-called new Christians live relatively quietly until 1536 when the Portuguese Inquisition was created. In the second half of the 16th century, Many new Christians who were accused of being bribed to Jewish in Portugal fled to Spain. The subsequent persecution, both in Spain and Portugal, created a major diaspora in Europe and the New World. Another Iberian diaspora, we will talk about it, is that of the Moriscos, 
these descendants of the Muslim Al-Andalus setters were forced to convert to Christianity in 1492, but King Philip III ordered their definitive expulsion in 1609. About 3,000 Moriscos were for to leave their lands and worships. Another major cause for migration in the early modern period was military conflict. And this is particular through for multi-ethnic East Central and Southeastern Europe. In these regions, the expansion and later withdrawal of the Ottoman Empire led to large scale processes of migration, which were continuous from the 16th century to the middle of the 18th century. The Ottoman army's move was where on the European continent, where it had controlled territories in the 14th century, created a large number of refugees with the aim of consolidating Ottoman rule over the recently conquered territories. Ethnic Tarts migrated westward, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes as a result of forced resettlement programs. The greatest migration flows in Eastral, East, Central, and Southeastern Europe were caused by the great wars such as the so-called Long War between 1593 and 1606, and the conquest of Hungary, Hungary by the Habsburgs at the end of the 17th century. The military conflicts with the Ottoman Empire, as well as with various North African rulers and the Crimean Tatars, also led to a steady stream of slaves from Europe to North Africa and the Middle East and vice versa. Sometimes it's difficult to make distinctions between coarse and forced migration. We will look at the movement of those who exchange their prison sentences in Europe for exile in overseas territories, and in so doing, played an important role in the formation of empires. For example, the Portuguese empire in West Africa and the Indian Ocean, Estado da India, depended on prisoners who served as soldiers in its outpost. Gypsies would also be transferred to the Iberian overseas territories. It is also worth mentioning the so-called Orphas del Rey, orphan daughters and widows, mostly of minor nobility who served the Portuguese crown, especially in the Estado da India. This migration, while forced by circumstances, open up interesting opportunities for these women and their families. The so-called Fil du Roi, sent by Louis XIV to New France, played a similar role in, in helping to increase the number of inhabitants of European descent in the French American territories. The migration of around 1 million indentured servants to the British colonies or to the Caribbean during the early modern period, we also consider here. Although we're not slaves, their living conditions uh, were often not so different. Europe and its colonies in the New World also play a key role, of course, in what is not only a particular gruesome example of forced migration, but most likely, the numerically largest global migration in the early modern period. The deportation of approximately 8.6 million enslaved Africans to the Americans between 1,500 and 1,800, let guide us to the conclusion. For Europeans, migration was common in the early modern period. However, migration was not always voluntary. Repressive policies prompted religious minorities, members of various Christian groups, 
use Muslims to settle elsewhere. Displacement caused by religious policies, as well as displacement caused by warfare, had wide ranging implications for economic, cultural, and intellectual life in the migrants' new homes, as well as the place they left behind. Migration was also stimulated by early modern authorities' deliberate settlement programs, which they undertook in order to repopulate war-torn landscapes, increase their hold on newly conquered territories, or attract particular talent. Europe's contact with the wider world, following the voyages of discovery in the 15th century, created new opportunities and destinations for migration, providing a way out for those who had few opportunities or substituting exile in the colonies for punishment at home. The continued practice of slavery finally resulted in the large scale deportation of people, especially from Africa across the Atlantic to Europe, New American colonies. These later movement have profound effects not only on the populations, economies, political conditions and culture of Europe itself, but also those of those of Africa and the Americas. In the 19th century, the manifestation of European influence and power and the worldwide presence of Europeans was expressed in dramatic histories of migrations. Europeans were on the move on an increasing scale. And this movement had a profound impact on the continent and the world at large. The increase in the mobility of Europeans took place, first of all, within Europe itself, with internal European migration of people moving between town and countryside, for instance. An increasing number of people were able to travel thanks to improved highways and waterways and to the fast expansion of the new railways. The same can be said for the upturn in migration beyond Europe. Even at this greater distance, facilitated by the building of large and fast steel steamships, migration was only partly a definitive immigration. Just as Europeans moved around within Europe, the global trajectory of migration was often more circular than linear. Even if European migrants settled permanently elsewhere, they remained in close contact with their homelands. Ironically, these tides of global migrations emerged alongside the growing influence of nationalism as an ideology, and of national states as the primary form of political organization. As migrants transition from one country and culture to another, they increasingly identify themselves as members of diasporic communities with strong ties with their nations of origin. At the same time, regional identities continue to play an important role in the broader context of developing nationalisms. As the, as the national states created new constitutional frameworks, that reinforce the position of national citizens, they also produce a new push factor of forced migration in the form of mass expulsion or sometimes discrimination against people who did not fit the specific characteristics of the nation as it was being defined by the state. In this sense, the increased mobility of Europeans was sometimes uh, driven not only by economic uh, needs and opportunities, uh, but also by political factors, which in occasions forced people to migrate. Actually, political exile was uh, ubiquitous in 19th century Europe. Typically, exile followed revolution and regime changes. Uh, from 1789 onwards, supporters of the previous regime and unsuccessful challengers of the powers that, be habitual, that uh, were, uh, were habitually um, going into exile. And this process continued well into the 1870s with the uh, Paris Commune and the socialist and anarchist upheavals at the end of the century. Among these exiles, there were many prominent political and intellectual figures. Just to take an example, Karl Marx, one of the most important intellectuals of the century, father of communism, he lived and produced most of his works in exile in Belgium, in France, in England. Actually, this kind of circulation of exiles also promoted the circulation and spread of political ideas and the configuration of an international political culture based on the principles of liberty, equality, and fraternity. However, it would be a mistake to consider that it was only liberals, republicans, or socialists who experienced exile. Counter-revolutionaries, reactionaries, and even royals, members of royal families, also went into exile. Um, 
not all these exiles were that famous, like Karl Marx or a king. Thousands of anonymous men and women also spent years in exile during the 19th century. Some of them even resided in spaces that were designed to receive them, including what today would be called refugee camps. The acceptance of large numbers of political refugees was sometimes inspired by tolerance of political pluralism, yet their presence was also a source of anxiety for political elites concerned with the import of violent political radicalism. Fears were triggered by the exiled revolutionaries of 1848 and 1871 and by the anarchists who targeted European heads of state in the 1890s. Each of these groups of political exiles were suspected to belong to international revolutionary networks. In London, for instance, the International Working Men's Association was established in 1864 as the first of several internationals which tried to unite all workers of the world. As a consequence of this, European security and police forces also developed an international network in their attempt to monitor and control the movement of people through systematic forms of registration and documentation like passports, visas, etc. The increased power of the state was um, another important factor which induced a growing number of people to leave their homelands. After the revolution of 48 and the Paris Commune of 71, thousands of French political opponents were deported to the colonies. Much larger numbers of refugees were fleeing war or ethnic cleansing, like for instance, the 200,000 Turks that were forced to flee after the independence of Greece, uh, the dictators that were expelled from um, uh, the Crimean Peninsula after the Crimean War by Russia in 56, or for instance, in the aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War, uh, there were uh, at least 80,000 Germans that were expelled from France, while uh, 130,000 French were forced to leave Alsace-Lorraine. In the Balkans, where continuous conflicts took place, uh, thousands of peoples were in the move, among them Armenians, Turks, Bulgarians, Greeks, and they moved between contested territories. Between 1880 and 1914, thus long before the Holocaust, around 2 uh, million uh, Jews from Russia and Eastern Europe escaped, uh, escaped persecution into uh, places such as the US or Palestine. Large uh, groups of people, like I said earlier, moved for social and economic reasons. That it, this included seasonal mobility or temporary migration. Yet many Europeans, probably the majority, especially in rural areas, especially the peasantry, remained tied to their birthplace, uh, birthplace for all their lives. Um, in many ways, the race of uh, liberalism in the 19th century was a factor behind this age of migration because it resulted in a general relaxation of the legal constraints of mobility. While legal and infrastructural conditions enable migration, the major motives for mass migration within Europe were economic, um, poverty, uh, need of work, need of better salaries. This implied that the processes of industrialization, of urbanization and migration were all interconnected processes which mutually stimulated each other. Um, let's look at this international and global aspect of migration in the 19th century. Uh, through the century, many more immigrants left Europe than immigrants from elsewhere entered the continent. It is calculated that around 55 to 60 million people left Europe in the 19th century for countries such as the USA, Argentina, Brazil, Australia, Canada. Um, most of them uh, we established were motivated by economic reasons. Uh, this, however, should not lead us to believe that they were all poor. Actually, some emigrants were not destitute at all, uh, as immigration requires some investment. In several cases, people sold their houses or their landed property in order to finance their trip and establish themselves in another country, in another continent. Um, these enterprising types of people were seeking the opportunity to improve their status, to accumulate savings overseas that in many occasions were uh, brought back and invested back home in their home countries. Um, and this is something that can be confirmed by the high rights of re-migration, that is the migrants that in fact travel back and forth, for instance, between America and Europe two or three times during their life. One important factor were uh, also the policies that some European states uh, developed to facilitate 
migration, for instance, by uh, offering financial and practical support to these migrants. Um, in most cases, these policies were also part of a general uh, product of the general desire to uh, make European states relieved uh, of the burden of poor and productive citizens, as they were considered by the state authorities. But uh, another important factor was that in the receiving countries, these states also designed policies to attract immigrants from uh, Europe. Perhaps even more important uh, was the decision, uh, more important for the decision to migrate was uh, the existence of previous family ties and local communities that had already uh, migrated. Uh, from connections to preceding pioneer migrants in communities such as this, aspiring immigrants receive information about the requirements of travel, the practical support uh, they needed once they arrived at the destination was given by these family members or members of their town um, in Europe. Um, they receive information about uh, work opportunities, they uh, develop contacts with uh, migrants, employers, etc. And this created what has been called a chain migration. So one group of migrants following another. Um, and this also made that many of these people remain connected to their national or regional communities once they had left Europe, thus contributing to the, emergencies, uh, to the emergence of nationally defined immigrant communities that in some occasions only partially assimilated into their new national identities overseas. This continued interaction between homeland and land of arrival also allowed for the return to Europe of many of them. Um, this, there are numbers that are very different, but uh, for instance, no more than 5% of all Jewish immigrants to the USA returned back to Europe. But however, if you look at migrants from places such as Bulgaria or Serbia, you see that before uh, the First World War, 90% of them had returned. Or for instance, if you look at the Italians who moved into the USA between 1905, 1915, um, um, many of them half approximately had uh, come back to Italy. While the 19th century can be seen as the age of voluntary migration, the 20th century presents a much more complicated picture. One important factor that shaped these experiences was the state, which played a much more active role in controlling migration from 1900 onwards. Particularly during the first half of the 20th century, large groups of people were pushed from one country to another by contradictory attempts of national states to restrict immigration and to enforce population transfers. Forced migration actually became one of the instruments of ethnic cleansing, next to forced assimilation and even genocide. In the first part of the century, uh, the flow of migration still largely moved away from Europe. In the second half, migrants started to move towards Europe. And while European migration already before the 19th century took place in a global context, a new surge of globalization after 1970 inaugurated the global migration system. In this context, migration was transformed from a, a 19th century solution um, against uh, overpopulation into a threat to national strength, both because enterprising people left the territory of the state and because other people, considered sometimes dangerous or unfit, came in. The First World War was an, import, an important impetus to the dislocation of people in Europe. Its scale brought about a massive movement of people who tried to flee from their homes. By 1917, the war had already produced around 7 million refugees. The end uh, of the First World War initiated yet another uh, wave of forced migration. Uh, during the collapse of the Russian Empire, the revolution and the subsequent civil war, uh, some 2 million people tried to escape from violence. Likewise, the defeat of the Central Powers resulted in the forced migration of approximately 1 million German nationals uh, into Germany. It was not only the consequence of the war, uh, but also a consequence of the peace treaties, which reinforced this process of ethnic sortition. The underlying principle of national self-determination informed the creation of new national states, each of which claimed the right to define the parameters of national identity and to insist on the removal of people who did not fit this definition. Often, this took the form of deliberate population exchanges. These transfers were a prelude to the restrictions of migrations that states came to impose in the course of the 1920s. 
motivated by racist ideas of cultural homogeneity, but also often supported by trade unions that opposed to the import of cheap labor. In the USA, the Immigration Act of 1924 imposed quotas that limited the immigration of Eastern and Southern Europeans, as well as Asians. But also within Europe, state closed their borders to foreigners. The turmoil in Europe created by the rise of Hitler and German expansionism brought about population movements which overwhelmed formal legal barriers. After the start of the war in 1939, uh, 39, hundreds of thousands of civilians in Poland and the Baltics fled, to, fled the region, while around 600,000 Polish prisoners of war ended up in German and Soviet camps. After Poland was overrun and its inhabitants ripped of their statehood, some 3 million inhabitants, half of them Jewish, were forcibly expelled from the western parts of the country and sent to the new established general government in the east. Many were sent to concentration and labor camps where most of them perished. Elsewhere in Europe, people were also forced to leave their homes or flee from violence. In 1939, in the context of the Spanish Civil War, around half a million Spaniards fled to France after the collapse of the Republic while uh, approximately 100,000 Greeks left uh, Macedonia and Thrace after it was occupied by Bulgaria in 1941. The number of people forced to leave their home increased after Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union and the Holocaust against Jews was unleashed. While Jews were deported, some 7 uh, point, um, million people, uh, German nationals and forced laborers, mainly from Poland and the Soviet Union, but also over 2 million from Western Europe, were brought into the pre-war territories of the German Empire. Moreover, the German army interned some uh, 5.7 million Soviet prisoners of war, of whom about half were starved to death or shot. At the same time, the Soviet uh, held some 3 million German prisoners of war. Before the war, in the 1930s, in Soviet territory, millions were uh, millions of citizens were already subject to deportation. The end of the war, however, saw another wave of forced migration. Uh, this post-war migration supplemented a much larger group of around 11 million displaced persons, most of whom uh, remain in Germany that was now occupied by the Allies. This group consisted, uh, consisted of prisoners of war, forced laborers, Jews, political prisoners, the largest group was Russian prisoners of war. The end of the Second World War also led to the expulsion of about 7 million German nationals from territories in Central Eastern Europe, from uh, Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, um, and many of them died in the course of these deportations. The transnational nature of uh, forced migration during the first half of the 20th century led in the second half of the century to the development of institutions dedicated to this cause. Um, this has already uh, begun uh, in the 1930s in the context of the League of Nations, when the first attempt, the convention relating to the international status of, ref of refugees was established in 1933. Yet there was no strong commitment to such collective responsibility among uh, international, the international community. A more successful collaboration only emerged in response to the massive refugee crisis at the end of the Second World War, when the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration was established in 1943. However, this initiative fell apart uh, soon in 1947, and it was replaced by the International Refugee Organization, which in turn in 1952 made way for the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. We enter now the period of the Cold War. Uh, from the 1950s onwards, migration patterns in Europe started to change after more than half a century of population transfers and deportation. The, democ the demography of Europe was, uh, had been um, drastically reordered. And as a result, uh, we can see that all around the continent, European states were now composed of much more homogeneous national groups, which at the same time consisted of many people who themselves were very recent migrants. The Cold War also led to uh, <clears throat> two ways uh, of migration flows in the East and in the Western part of the continent. Uh, in the Eastern part of the continent, countries 
um, that fell into the Soviet sphere of influence were um, generally confronted with immigration of political and ethnic minorities, further reinforcing the cultural uniformity of these countries. Uh, despite it is true that there was some immigration from developing countries, from places from, from Africa, from Asia, that came into uh, communist countries for their formation, uh, etc. Western Europe, on the other hand, became a region of immigration, which led to new forms of uh, diversity. It is in the context of the Cold War and the imposition of communist rule in uh, Eastern Europe that many people uh, started to flee from oppression. Until the construction of the Berlin Wall in, in 1961, uh, more than 3 million people had um, fled from East to West Germany. Also, tens of thousands of people left from other communist countries uh, every year. After the partial liberalization of immigration policies in the Soviet Union in the 1980s, more than half of the remaining 2.0 million Jews fled from the persistent anti-Semitic tendencies that they experienced. A final chapter of emigration from communist countries resulted from the war initiated in um, the early 90s uh, in Yugoslavia uh, that made approximately 400,000 people uh, flee. Um, the picture to be sketched from Western Europe in the post-war uh, period is different. Their immigration sets the tone immigration from other places of Europe, mo mostly Southern Europe, but also from Northern Africa and former colonies. From uh, 1948 into the 1970s, Western Europe went through an extended period of economic growth. That meant that uh, more workers were needed. There was shortages on the labor market. This inspired governments to, inv to invite um, workers to come uh, to work in the industrial centers of Europe. Uh, these guest workers. Initially, many came from the poorest regions of Italy, Spain, Portugal, and they were migrating to France, to Germany, to the Benelux countries. Between the 1950s and 1970s, several million Italian, Spaniards, Portuguese ended up thus in the economies of Northwestern Europe. But the demand for labor kept growing, and that led to the attraction of workers from other countries, places like Morocco, like Turkey, the truth is that governments um, and also parts of the population, um, even though they invited these workers, in many occasions, they also show um, hostility uh, to them. We now move into another um, phenomenon, which is the immigration, the immigration of um, people coming from uh, former colonies. Uh, we know that decolonization um, created new contexts uh, new forms of colonial or post-colonial or neo-colonial citizenship and, and, and therefore substantial numbers of formerly colonized people made their way to the imperial centers of power uh, via family ties, labor immigration, or sometimes as refugees. And they contributed to the creation of a multi-ethnic European society, which at the same time, many Europeans found hard to acknowledge. Thus, in the post-imperial societies of Britain, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Portugal, immigration from former colonies became a major phenomenon in the last third of the 20th century, reversing the realities of the early 20th century, when the presence of populations originating from the colonies was minimal in the imperial metropoles, but European empires encouraged the emigration of their own citizens to settler colonies. Thus, decolonization after the Second World War led to the repatriation, repatriation of millions of Europeans. While Britain put an end to the free movement of Indians in 1947 after Indian independence, France, on the contrary, introduced agreements with its former colonies that became independent in the uh, 1960s, allowing entry into French territory without the visa or the residence permit. This liberal migration policy, however, was brutally curtailed uh, after the oil crisis in 1973-74. Then restrictive measures were put in place uh, that continued into the 1990s, transforming the nationals of territories which formerly enjoyed a form of imperial citizenship uh, into foreigners. Uh, the end of um, the 20th century in uh, stark contrast uh, to its beginning uh, has been characterized by free, peaceful and mostly voluntary movements. The end of the Cold War and the fall of the uh, Iron Curtain in 1889, 1890, 
ushered in a period of seemingly frictionless mobility in the supranational framework of the European Union. The adoption of the Schengen Agreement in 1985 and then the Schengen Convention opened up an area of free movement between member states, but also put in place compens compensatory measures, as they were called, to secure external borders and prevent them from being crossed by nationals of non-member uh, non countries. We turn now into the 21st century. Um, the beginning of the 21st century has certainly clouded this optimistic image. Migration has once more become a contentious issue. Uh, for instance, the so-called refugee crisis of 2015 arguably led to the rise to a rise in populism and um, the polarization of European politics. Also, the Frontex agency, which has been operating the integrated management of European borders since 2005, has expanded and strengthened its power uh, since 2016. And it embodies a migration policy that turns the Schengen area into what is sometimes called fortress Europe, that is a tightly sealed, self-contained and exclusive space. Yet, this, all these contemporary concerns re in reality pale in comparison to the staggering numbers of people forced to migrate around into and out of Europe over the course of the very violent 20th century. 